this philosophy. I'm not the most proficient person in the room. I mean, I am, but I'm not the most proficient person in the room, Mm -hmm. but together we are the epitome of proficiency. And so we get to have this experience of being learners together. And I really work hard for them to to break the veil of teacher to student. And I really work to be co-learners and co-conspirators in my classroom. It's Taj of the and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another episode of All the Above, the show that gives you an unstandardized take on education. I'm Jeffrey Garrett, one of your co-hosts, and I've been a middle and high school principal and a high school social studies teacher. And as always, I'm joined by... What up, family? It's Manuel Rustin, your favorite teacher's favorite teacher. I'm a high school history teacher here in the Los Angeles area. And this, of course, is All the Above, your home for news and analysis of all matters pertaining to our world of education. We'd like to welcome everyone back to All of the Above and those of you who might be joining us for the very first time. Shout out to you um, and shout out to whoever helped you come across our show. Definitely, we like to center marginalized perspectives as we discuss the school system here in all things related to the world of education. And we like to feature some super dope guests. So if this is your first time around, definitely consider subscribing, hitting that thumbs up, all that good stuff. But also know that our website, AOTA Show, has like years and years of dope conversations with dope people, many of whom you have heard of and many of whom will be helping you understand how we can build a better and more just and more humanizing school system for all of our young folks out there. Jeff, we are back. It is, um, it's, it's October now. It's officially spooky season, Jeff. And since we like to ask <laughs> the hard hitting questions here on all of the above, I have a question for you. Pertaining to spooky season, Jeff, I want to know, as an administrator, wearing your like super duper dope principal leader man hat, which one is scarier? Showing up to your school site in the morning and seeing a whole bunch of kids in the hallways because evidently no teacher or sub has showed up? Or being at lunch and seeing a mob of kids suddenly rush towards something? which often indicates Mm. a fight or something wild happening. Mm. Which scenario is scarier to you, Jeff? Yeah, man, well, I'm going to go with the lunch mob situation. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you know, I think every uh, principal has probably had the you know, the, the nightmare of <laughs> you show up to school and there's no, no teachers are there, uh, you know, but like, in that case, the kids are diffuse. They're spread out. You know, worst right. thing that's happening is like a couple kids making out in the corner or something, or like all the kids are on their phones doing whatever they do on their phones. Uh, you know, it's a solvable non-emergency situation. Um, whereas the uh, the mob <laughs> rush in the lunch situation is, uh, you know, potentially very dangerous. So yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with option B, Manuel. Final answer. Nice, nice. I imagine that that would be the the more frightening scenario. However, I'm not a administrator, so I haven't really had to. I mean, I've been, I've been around on campus when things have gone down, and I found myself in the middle of trying to break those things up. So yes, that's not a, it's not fun, especially in this age of um, cell phone video and um, you know whatever happens, you're you're about to be an internet star probably in that situation. So, all right. All right. I feel that. I feel that. Um, Well, Jeff, we are back with another full episode. Our most recent full episode featured the illustrious Dr. Goldie Muhammad discussing the importance of joy in education, especially amid these very troubling times. Now, we know, our folks know, our, our AOTA family knows that if we have a full episode, video format and all that good stuff, we must have another super dope guest in the building. So, Jeff, please break it down for us. What's on the agenda today? Well, Manuel, we got a good one for everybody, as per usual. Uh, and today, Manuel, I'm excited because we are bringing some genius, some excellence, some uh, classroom dopeness, some scholar researcher dopeness to all the above today coming straight from my uh, former home, in some ways my my spiritual home, New York City and the great borough of Brooklyn. Brooklyn most definitely in the house today. Uh, Folks, we have a guest today, uh, Lamar Timmons Long. You may uh, recognize the name or follow him on social media. 
Um, but he's a dynamic high school English teacher uh, out in New York City and also is currently pursuing his doctoral studies uh, at NYU focused on ethnic studies and Afrofuturism. So we're going to have really a, a dynamic conversation today, Manuel, both about the, the kind of genius and art it takes to create a dynamic and affirming learning space in the high school classroom and also the very important role that practitioners play or hopefully can play uh, in the doctoral study space, particularly in the PhD space, and sort of closing that gap or that divide that we sometimes feel between the, the practitioners on the ground in the schoolhouse and, and the folks in the ivory tower. So um, going to be a fascinating conversation today, folks. Stick around. You definitely don't want to miss it. Yeah, sounds dope. Sounds dope. But of course, we're going to first take a look at recent news and headlines in the world of education in a segment that we like to call The Do Now. Coming up next. All right, folks, now it's time for The Do Now. Let's take a look at some news in the world of education. Jeff, how are we going to do The Do Now today? Well, Manuel, it's always important in school. First order of business, most often in the morning, is got to take roll. Got to see who's in the house. Time for that roll call, Manuel. Yeah, roll call. Let's take attendance. Let's see who's here. First name on the roster today, Jeff, is um, Bill Nye. Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, one of the more fantastic phenomenal figures in television history I, I would argue right like uh yeah maybe not quite at the at the mr rogers uh level but like you know next tier down would you say like a dude who made his career teaching kids to love nerdy geeky fun science kind of stuff right yeah and still today is doing you know great science education and and science communication work um i will say manuel something little known but fascinating fact about bill nye because he's often talking about scientific disciplines that weren't actually his discipline that he studied he was an engineer but you often see him talking about like astrophysics ah. or climate change or things of that nature so not that you know a person can't be multifaceted but right. he's an engineer and we we didn't always hear him talking about like engineering per se so uh shout out to bill nye science guy love it yeah for sure for sure also makes me wonder what happened to uh do you remember Beekman's World? Like Beekman's World was that like? Oh a, yeah. <laughs> was that like a competing program? Were they like rivals? Is there like a a true story out there about like the beef between Bill Nye or Beekman, or were they just you know pleasant friends and Beekman just you know I don't know what happened to Beekman. Hopefully he's good and healthy and you know all that good stuff. But yeah, all right. Bill Nye the Science Guy. He's in the building today, Jeff, because we have a science story, a science story. Sometimes people mm. say, oh, all of the above. They talk about race and politics too much, too much race stuff, too much woke stuff. Okay, let's talk about science. All right, let's keep politics and race out of it for this story. This story we get from Scientific American, uh, from some reporting by Alyssa Scherer and Alex Music. Actually, this isn't reporting. This is an opinion piece by two scientists, and they argue that quote, educational intimidation laws being passed in dozens of states, gut science classes of social context and inclusive design, which jeopardizes progress towards equitable science. They call out DeSantis's, Florida Governor DeSantis's general anti-science agenda in Florida and point out that it has reached education as evidenced by his beef with the College Board over AP Psychology's Gender and Sexuality Unit and the state approving anti-science revisionist resources like PragerU for classroom use. Now comes Florida's SB 266 uh, bill, which aims to eliminate, quote, identity politics in general education courses, both in K-12 and, importantly, in higher education. So the authors of this piece argue that the while traditional STEM classes might not cover targeted those targeted topics that fall into quote unquote identity politics. Um, many science educators have begun teaching about how racism, colonialism, and sexism have perpetuated, have been perpetuated by scientists. 
Now, without discussing historical atrocities, such as the testing of birth control medication on Puerto Rican Puerto Rican women or the ways in which scientific data such as facial measurements and genetics has been used to support racist theories, we now risk future generations of scientists lacking the knowledge necessary to conduct ethical research or refute dangerous pseudoscience. What's more, under the DeSantis administration, politicians could argue that climate change is speculative. The authors write, Quote, we cannot legislate that a natural science curriculum must educate students on the scientific method if something as evidence-backed as the climate crisis might be outlawed. Now, of course, restrictions on addressing social issues and diversity within science and within everywhere will also likely deepen inequities and underrepresentation in STEM fields. So, Jeff, the scientists have weighed in. They don't, they don't like this stuff that's happening in Florida and other places. Jeff, what are your thoughts on this story, on this science lens to the general attack on our humanity and attack on truth telling and attack on explorations of race in the classroom? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Manuel, I love this story because I appreciate the, the wading into this space of our, of our STEM colleagues. Now, I, you know, I'm, I don't claim to be a monthly subscriber to Scientific American, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and say this is not exactly like, like a wokeity woke publication or anything, right? Like, like this is a fairly, main, fairly mainstream, uh, you know, sort of uh, popular uh, publication. And uh, even they are seeing the, you know, existential threat that this, uh, this, you know, deeply troubling, uh, disturbing, authoritarian right-wing push and, and Christian nationalist push to intrude into public education is, is having and will continue uh, to have on the very foundations of, you know, of teaching all of the core disciplines in school. And it's making me think, Manuel, that everything is political, right? Like there, there really is, of course, there are degrees to it, but there really is no sort of act or no choices made in education that aren't political. So when these folks talk about, you know, we want traditional education that's, you know, not about indoctrination and this and that, this is, this is their, you know, sort of traditional uh, twisting of words tactic, because absolutely what they're trying to do is indoctrinate into their oppressive worldview, right? Um, and even even folks who are you know tend not to want to wade into that space recognize the deep harms that this can have, both in you know being able to say we are properly educating people in the STEM fields and also in the demographics of folks who would choose to pursue those fields if they are experiencing an absence of themselves in the curriculum, if they're experiencing a the denial of a lot of the complicated history of, of you know, the various scientific fields um, where, you know, things like eugenics or things like, you know, medical experimentation or all these sorts of things are part of the history and are part of the lessons that we have learned and should talk about. You know, science does not exist in a vacuum just because the scientific method, you know, um, attempts to isolate variables. The practice of science does not happen in isolation of the world around it. And so I'm, I'm very excited that this piece was written, Manuel. It does make me, it reinforces for me, Manuel, uh, the belief that this this set of practices, the Ron DeSantis type of thinking and the many, many other governors and state legislators and local officials who are of similar mind know what they are doing and are carrying out a campaign of psychological warfare on the children, the communities and educators um, in this country. This has, this has absolutely nothing to do with any sort of like real principled stance or values of any sort. This is absolutely an attempt to, you know, uh, to legislate oppressive pedagogy and oppressive content. Um, and they feel threatened <laughs> by, by the kind of stuff we just talked about uh, with Goldie Muhammad uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, I, I do think, Manuel, it calls even more strongly for there to be proactive federal uh, lawsuits and regulation on this kind of stuff in schools. This is actively doing harm, and we know it. There should be lawsuits happening left and right using the language of their own, you know, uh, legislation against them. 
to, you know, to say like, how can we do a good job of teaching this content if we can't actually teach all of the content? Uh, you know, we have to be silent on very important issues of race and identity and gender and this sort of stuff. So uh, frustrating, Manuel. I'm glad these folks are wading into the conversation. I respect it. I hope for more because this is an existential threat to all of us, whether we're in Florida or not. Yeah, absolutely. And this is this story here is for all those teachers out there who when issues, uh, matters of, of race and equity and discussions um, around those sorts of things come up in PD or come up wherever, um, all those teachers out there that think, oh, it doesn't really apply to my classroom. I'm just a math teacher. I'm a science teacher. Like that stuff doesn't really, um, it doesn't really show up in our curriculum. Yeah, this is a important reminder that it does. Absolutely. And here you have some scientists specifically laying out and there's other ways that they laid it out in the article besides uh, what we've just uh, shared uh, right here. So again, the, the link to the article is below. But they're laying out the multiple ways in which these matters do show up in science classes, in science curriculum, and why it's so important to continue to remember that. Now, you know, I, I, I think for myself as a social science teacher, I'm, I'm really, really frustrated every time I hear folks uh, try to claim that like this is just, just the social sciences or the humanities where uh, matters of equity are important to discuss and explore with students. So, um, you know, this is a piece that I could uh, maybe share out to some educators out there who are wondering how it applies. And it reminds me of the conversation that we had on the show um, a few years ago, like back in the summer of 2020, everybody was scrambling for like wanting to find the resources because they too wanted to be an ally and wanted to be anti-racist all of a sudden and all that stuff. And I remember we had a discussion with the scientist, uh, Dr. Terrence Keel of UCLA, um, who broke down some of the ways in which science and the way science has been taught, particularly, in, particularly biology, some of the ways that it has been used to uphold white supremacy and really uphold uh, oppressive thinking. So, you know, well, maybe if we remember, we'll go back and link that episode below this too for those who need that reminder. But yeah, this, um, this, these attacks are not limited to just Florida, as we've said many a time on the show, and they're not limited to just the so-called woke type curriculum. They're, they're, they expand across the way. Like once the college board became a target, once uh, science classes now here in this case becoming targets, like you know, like there is no limit to it. So if you've been sitting here this whole time as an ed educator thinking, yeah, but I don't teach out there or I don't teach that subject, like I ain't got to worry about it. Nah, you got to worry about it. This is all hands on deck situation because our education system as we know it is under attack and just our our efforts to come together as humans and uplift each other's humanity and really advance our thinking around what it means to be human and what it means to be on this planet, all of that is under attack. And it's very important that we sound the alarm. I appreciate these authors sounding the alarm. And uh, I, I don't know, hopefully eventually enough people get it, enough people realize like, wait, it is my problem too that you know the the resistance can can come together and the solidarity between the science community between the uh, K-12 community, the higher ed community, uh, just everybody hopefully could come together and that solidarity maybe could be enough to to push back against this in a way where we win because this right here cannot stand at all. Bill Nye would not stand no. for this. I know that for a fact. I know Bill Nye would be like, "What the hell?" So like, yeah, man, we gotta we gotta fight against this, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bill, Bill, I have seen some videos online of Bill, yep. of Bill Nye, uh, particularly through the lens of climate denialism, which obviously these, you know, these right wingers are very much part and parcel of. Um, but it is their right, uh, the authors of this piece in, in Scientific American, of, of saying that this is actually an anti-science agenda in as much as it's a racist and homophobic and sexist agenda. It is also very much an anti-science agenda. And um, it, it does call us, man. Well, as you know, uh, Dr. Terrence Keel mentioned on our show uh, several years ago, you know, that the construction of what was considered, you know, accepted scientific uh, theory has had a very checkered past, right? Um, and I think we're just like objectively in a better place in terms of the practice of science today than we were 100 years ago or 500 years ago. But, uh, you know, phrenology and eugenics and, you know, these the, the sort of, well, obviously, you know, God created X class of people to be inferior to this other group of people. And can't you tell by looking at their face or looking at their noses or looking at the shape of their skull 
or, you know, because they don't have as much muscle mass on a certain part of their body or, you know, like the, the, the potential to weaponize pseudoscience against people when folks are uneducated in how science works is very high and very, you know, and, and it could be very damaging. So I appreciate them speaking up. I hope we see more like this, Manuel, and um, we, we got to stay vigilant out here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Must stay vigilant, must continue to fight together and resist together. Well, Jeff, we have another name on the roster for today's attendance, for today's roll call. Who we got, Jeff? Who we got? Well, Manuel, today we got a, we got a group of folks. Uh, okay. We got those tech bros, Manuel, some tech bros in the house. <laughs> tech bros. I do not like tech bros. I am starting to think that the picture is becoming more and more clear that the tech bro community has done more harm to our economy, to our society, to everything around us than we ever give them credit for. I think we need a full expose on all the harms conducted by Silicon Valley and those tech bros who have just been trying to cash in on all things while destroying all sorts of systems around us. But yeah, uh, I get, okay, so tech bros are in the building, Jeff? I don't. I don't know what you're talking about, Manuel. They, they have brought us so many great things like Teslas. They have brought us, uh, you know, social media that makes kids feel worse about themselves the more time they spend on it. They've brought the ability for people to uh, do gig work and not get benefits, um, you know, and have to work two and three jobs with, with no health insurance. I mean, come on, man. What, what more could you ask you're right. for, Manuel? You're right. My bad. Yeah. My bad, tech bros. <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, shout out to uh, underpaid gig workers all over the country. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's let's get into this, folks. This is a fascinating story. Something we've touched on before on the show, but perhaps here with a, a new angle. So let's get into it. Uh, this story comes to us uh, from uh, from a story written by Mark Kuliber in the seventy four million, and uh, there's some startling new research out, which shows how schools have given for-profit tech companies a massive data portal into young people's everyday lives. This according to a new report by researchers at the University of Chicago and NYU. The report highlights how the scramble to adopt new technologies in schools has served to create an $85 billion with a B, dollar industry with significant data security risks for teachers, parents, and students. Student privacy is rarely a top consideration when teachers adopt new digital tools, researchers learned in interviews with district technology officials. In fact, schools routinely lack the resources and know-how to assess potential vulnerabilities. Researchers found significant issues were widespread, including the use of cookies that track user behavior to deliver personalized advertisements, as well as more extensive data tracking capabilities embedded in many educational tech platforms and software. Most alarming to the researchers were the 7.4% of the programs they studied that used session recorders, a type of tracker that documents a user's every move while engaged with a platform or website. Now, the report's co-author, Jake uh, Chaninson, hope I'm saying that correctly, a University of Chicago PhD student said, quote, what you do in the classroom shouldn't be harvested and sold, especially when many of these companies are raking in somewhere between five and seven figure contracts to license this technology. The things they can take from students can be incredibly alarming. Information about socio-emotional behavior. So if I act out in school, if I am in trouble for something that's happening at home, or if I'm bullying another student, that data is collected by a specific service, and that data is held somewhere. And of course, when you hold data, it's a security risk, end quote. So, Manuel, um, we've talked about this before with maybe with more sort of uh, suspicious lens or questioning yeah. lens or in connection to some of the large data breaches that we've seen across the country. But this report is now revealing uh, a, more of a survey of like what kinds of data mining and, uh, and data extraction practices are these ed tech companies. And some of these are big, like Google. Some of these are little ones you've never heard of. Uh, but the kinds of practices they are employing and the vulnerabilities this can intrude, this can bring into the classroom. Um, so you, as a teacher, who I'm sure has, uh, you know, at least 
what, a, a, a dozen or so of these kinds of technologies that you probably have to interact with uh, in any given week on the job. Um, I would love to get your take on this, Manuel. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Like with this, this story right here is just uh, confirming our deepest suspicions. One of my deepest suspicions about the just the 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 influx of all these different tech tools that we use it, uncritically, I should say, we just uncritically use them. When I say we, I mean classroom teachers, um, also school systems that adopt them. Just uncritically, like, oh, here's a cool little tool that we could use so that when students watch this video, there's a way for them to interact and this and that, whatever. I could put it through my Google Classroom or my Canvas page or Schoology, whatever I'm using, uh, my LMS. And just, uh, I, I'm so upset about this story for many reasons. So flatly, there's no reason why any private company should be allowed to collect data from minors, period. I don't care what they say about the data is, is, is made anonymous and the, the, the details are, are scrubbed and this and that. I don't care what they say because I don't trust them. They, they have no reason to, to tell us the full truth about what they're using the data for or just how many steps it takes to go ahead and help identify this young person and connect them to this data that's being stored on some server somewhere. I don't trust it at all. It's dangerous. I don't know why we are still here living in a world where there aren't clear federal protections against this. And then by that, I mean, school districts adopt these technologies. School districts, most of them probably don't have the legal team to fully understand the terms of service. And we as teachers just have kids go log in, log in with your district account or whatever. And we just boom, go in there. And the terms of service are like two, 300 pages long. You need your own lawyers to understand it. And these tech companies get away with so much as is spelled out by the study here. And it's deeply, deeply, dangerous to have that much data about your young person existing in the private space somewhere because we have no idea what's going to become of that data. We have no idea if this young person is going to be applying for some position when they're 25 and somehow, some way, the data from when they were 13 shows up in that space somehow in the you know background checks and all that. We just don't know. And they're using this to profit also. So there's the other part of it in terms of like what percentage of those billions are coming back to the school system or to families from this data that's being mined. Uh, it's just deeply, deeply dangerous and disturbing. Um, there's no place for it and yet it happens. There, are, when, if I, when I go to our little, uh, our, our district site that has like all the different tech tools laid out, all the different icons of the things that we have available, there's so many there that I've not even heard of and it's like, how do we know that this is safe? How do we know that this is worthwhile? Like there should be no data tracking, data mining from young people, period. And for those who are like, well, how are we gonna know what their behaviors are online and how to optimize this and optimize that? Man, get universities to do it. Go through an IRB like everybody else has to do when you're trying to collect data, when you're trying to research something, go through an uh, actual IRB at an academic space if you need that information about young people's uh, activities through these different different tech tools. Otherwise, stay the hell out of it. I just, it's so disgusting to me and there's, it's, it just feels like there's no oversight. As a classroom teacher, it feels like there's no oversight. Like a new tech tool will pop up and I'm like, why do we have it? Wh who approved this? How do we know that whoever approved it doesn't have like their own little side thing with this company? And like, why do we trust this company? And help me understand this terms of services, this, these terms of service before I tell my students hop over this link, log in through your district account, do this, do that. And it's just, um, it all has happened so fast and the pandemic sped it all up. This race for tech tools to help address the challenges of the pandemic. Those tech bros have made billions and billions and billions of dollars. And I don't see much, if any, good coming from it. I really, really hate this. This is, um, this is not good. Yeah. I, so there's very little that you said there, Manuel, that, that uh, <laughs> I, th I think is not spot on, um, or at least asking very important questions that largely, you know, I think go unanswered. I will say to me, Manuel, the, um, while certainly it is a, a threat of this, that the information about a young person could be, you know, weaponized against them years down the line when they're an adult or something like that is definitely a potential and should be taken seriously. But honestly, my most... My biggest worry and concern about this is actually much more short term and much more, you know, seemingly benign, but it's actually deeply problematic, Manuel. And that is that these companies that gather data and sell data 
are often like that becomes their most lucrative, you know, sort of angle of their business. So the big companies, Google, Facebook, right? We think Google is a search engine. We think Facebook is a social media company. We think Amazon is a company that sells stuff in a marketplace, right? Now, these are data companies that gather massive, massive amounts of data and sell that data to other parties so that it can be weaponized against you, particularly in the form of manipulating you to make choices about how you use your time and where you spend your money. And the fact that they are engaging in this same practice with children to me is both deeply unethical, it should be illegal, as you said, like there's no way we should allow this kind of data mining of young people at all, for any reason, under any circumstance, like it should be just patently against the law, yes. right? With very stiff penalties, like corporate death penalties, if you are caught, you know, violating this, right? Like we take half your stock shares and we fire your whole board, right? Like like that kind of yeah. consequence should should be the consequence if, if this is the sort of behavior you're engaging with, with the data of young people. And here's why I say that, Manuel, because we know that young people are the most susceptible, the most easily manipulable people in our society. Right. Um, I mean, I guess you could argue the very elderly might be similarly vulnerable. Right. But this is like the people who need a custodial adult to take care of them are extremely vulnerable in this way. And uh, and so the the potential for predation in this equation is extremely high. Um, and we might think of it as like, well, you know, what's the big deal, right? How's it different than just like commercials for Cheerios during your Saturday morning cartoons or whatever, right? And you could argue that that's deeply problematic as well and we shouldn't <laughs> allow that, right? Like, I'm here for that conversation too. But this is different from the standpoint of they are gathering intimate data. Think about all the things that kids put into these systems and that educators put into these systems about kids, right? Uh, qualitative observations about their mood, their behavior, their, you know, struggles they're having at home or with their own feelings about certain things or their identity about certain things. Um, you know, they're writing papers about personal stuff in there. They're answering, you know, questions about things that, it, you know, that have to do with the world around them. And all that information, you can absolutely be sure. And well, there's no way these folks are just stopping at some innocent, benign use of this. They're using this data to triangulate it with other data points about those kids' parents, about yep. the, you know, like the people around them that control the dollars. Right. Um, and to manipulate kids into making certain kinds of decisions that can then be leveraged to cause them to want things that maybe they didn't even want to use their money or their time in certain ways like this. This is all about manipulation and controlling your time and your at your focus, your attention and controlling your money and the money of those people around you. And that's what this is about. It should be absolutely illegal when it comes to educational software. Like it's, it boggles my mind that we would allow this at all. Now I will say yeah. the the author of this piece talked about like anytime you store data, there's a risk. Like we do need to store data in education, right? Like we do want a kid's transcript, you know, for for all right. four years of high school. We don't want to just delete the grades, you know, from year to year, for example, right? So you know, this kind of thing is important, and. This kind of thing also needs to have some very important guardrails put up, and it needs to be the kind of thing where, you know, absolutely the only use of this data is by educators with kids and with families, or by kids and families themselves, you know, with whoever they want to share that information with. But, um, you know, this is like super easy. This should just be like a, like a half-page law that's like, this data belongs exclusively to the, you know, the, uh, for the use of the educators who work with the kids and families and with the kids and families, and that's it. And corporations may not use it in any way, shape, or form, uh, you know, other than to report it back to those audiences. And if you do it, you know, 50 years in jail and a billion dollar fine, like, which yeah. increases exponentially each time you get fined. Like, you know, it should be that type of thing. Well, this is very, very simple in that sense. It, it truly is. It truly is. And we certainly can't expect any help from our political leaders because so many of their campaign contributions come from the Sil Silicon Valley tech bro world. So they're not going to stand up and defend us. We definitely need individual educators at each district always asking the critical questions about why did we just adopt this technology? What do we know about it? What do our lawyers say? We don't we didn't have any lawyers to look at it. Well, 
full stop. We got to have a legal team look at it before because uh, otherwise we're just going to continue to just adopt things because they seem cool, seem convenient. Ooh, look what we could do now with our students. And lo and behold, data is being mined from our minors, from our children. And nobody in the school system could directly tell me where that data sits and what makes it safe and secure, allegedly. So it's very troubling stuff, very troubling stuff. I am very anti-tech bro, as I said at the top. All right, let's, let's, let's transition to, to something more joyful because, oh man, I just, I truly, truly hate what has become of um, tech bro culture and um, all the different systems that have been attacked and destroyed by it. So let's, let's transition to something positive, bring on a super dope guest to uh, discuss the intersections of uh, joy and justice in the classroom and in the ac academic space, all right? So super dope guest up ahead in our seminar, coming up next. Hey folks, thanks so much for tuning in to All The Above. We really appreciate you. And as you know, All The Above is a small operation. It's just me and just Manuel, that's it. We have no sponsorships, which means we are totally dependent on our amazing audience to help support the show. So here's what you can do. Go to our website, which is aotashow.com slash support. That's aotashow.com slash support. There you can find links to everything you can do to support the show. You find all the links to every platform that we're on where you can like, subscribe, follow, make sure you share our show with your whole network. Also, you can donate there. We are on Venmo, we're on Cash App, and most importantly, you can find the link to our Anchor page where you can become a monthly patron. Even a small donation once a month will make a huge difference in helping us continue to produce the show. Lastly, you can find there the link to get your flyest, best, latest, all the above show merch. Okay, all you gotta do is go to aotashow.com slash support. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the show. All right, folks, welcome to today's seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. And we are here today, and I'm just, I'm very excited, both because we have a guest who's coming to us uh, by, by the miracles of, uh, of satellite television, folks, uh, as they used to say, the miracle of Zoom, all the way from the other side of the country, my former home, uh, and a place that's very special to me, Brooklyn, New York, um, who's here with us today to just bring both a classroom practitioner and a doctoral student level of genius to our conversation here on the all here on all the above. Uh, welcome, Lamar Timmons Long. Thank y'all so much for having me. It's good to see y'all. What's up, everybody? Yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, folks, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Lamar Timmons Long is a vibrant educator in New York City who believes that every student deserves access to an equitable, equitable and transformative educational experience. His main work centers around ethnic studies, Afrofuturism, and anti-racist education, intersections between literacy, social justice, and language, as well as students experiencing disabilities. He has served as the secondary representative at large for the National Council of Teachers of English and is a current member of the Diversity Committee. Lamar is a proud SUNY Buffalo State University alum and teaches high school English in his hometown of Brooklyn, New York. He's also an adjunct professor at Hunter College in the School of Education and is currently working towards his PhD at NYU. Uh, welcome again, Lamar, and I'm going to kick it over to Manuel for our first question. Yeah, we got Brooklyn in the house. We got some New York City dopeness here with us today on All the Above. Lamar, thank you for taking time out of your very busy um, classroom teaching and doctorate pursuing schedule uh, to join us here for a conversation. We uh, very much do appreciate that. And you're somebody who has um, developed a reputation for cultivating a really dope and humanizing classroom space for young folks. And, you know, here on All the Above, when we talk about issues impacting our marginalized Youth. Sometimes we we talk to, talk about these big themes, and and it's important sometimes for us to tap back in to the classroom practice and and learn about or discuss what this good work 
looks like in the classroom. Now, you as somebody who leads a classroom standing firmly at the intersection of justice and joy, we would love to hear about what Mr. Long's class looks like and um, how do you connect with today's young folks out there? So my classroom is literally the epitome of organized chaos. So I have the <laughs> pleasure of, uh, for the last few years, I've had the pleasure of looping with my students and so I've been able to teach them from sophomore to senior year. And that is one of the things that grounds our relationship, this concept that we've been together for so long. And then I think about like what like young Lamar needed as a teacher. I mean, as a student, I should say. And I think about what makes a classroom a space for kids to just be kids because at the end of the day that's really what i want i really just want to cultivate a space where kids can be themselves and so on the academic side you know we do everything from like discourse and writing and peer reviewing and conversations and reading of texts that are a reflection of themselves but also windows right to other communities and experiences but on the other side it's a space where we could just come and kick it. We eat together. We laugh together. We know topic conversation is off the table. And so I think centering my work in Paulo Ferry's Pedagogy of Love and Bell Hooks um, Engaged Pedagogy really forces me to think about what my students need the most, both as a human being and then also as uh, an academic. And I think about if I would have had those spaces as a teenager, how that would have shifted so much for me. And so a lot of my work is grounded in love and creating a space full of love, but also creating a space where it's a liberatory experience for both them and myself, because I have this philosophy. I'm not the most proficient person in the room. I mean, I am, but I'm not the most proficient person in the room, mm -hmm. but together we are the I, epitome of proficiency. And so we get to have this experience of being learners together. And I really work hard for them to, to break the veil of teacher to student. And I really work to be co-learners and co-conspirators uh, in my classroom. Mm. Wow, I appreciate that, uh, that kind of paradigm shift, uh, I think that you're offering us to, to think about there, Lamar, as you know, together we are, uh, you know, the epitome of proficiency and, and leveraging the collective genius of, of the classroom. And uh, just, just appreciate that nugget of wisdom there. Um, also, we are in this historical moment right now where you are a teacher of English, you're a teacher of English who brings that lens that you just named to the classroom uh, in a context where even though you as an educator in New York City and we as educators here in the Los Angeles area may not feel the immediate sting of this, but we are existing in a larger environment in which, you know, we have books being banned. We have, you know, the, the discussion of um, any ideas related to an honest telling of history or a critical examination of power and privilege and identity in the classroom is being made illegal, where teachers are, you know, having their, their jobs or their credentials threatened for even talking about these kinds of things in, in the classroom. And we have been talking about this a bunch on the show and, and asked this question to other guests. We most certainly uh, wanted to, to hear your thoughts on this issue, but how do you approach uh, teaching in the way you do with the lens that you do um, in this particular historical time? And, and how would you, or what kinds of off, uh, offerings of advice or um, you know, guidance might you offer to folks who want to do the work the way you're describing, but are doing so in a context that might be to some degree more hostile uh, to that type of teaching than, um, you know, than would be ideal? I think that's a really good question. So because I teach in New York City, because uh, New York State and New York City are two different entities. <laughs> so because I teach in New York City and because I have the administrator that I have, I really have this freedom to teach. And so I am really able to cultivate uh, a curriculum that is going to be reflective of my students, but also push them in areas that they just need to evolve and grow as people. Because Teaching for me is all about humanity and I think, and the greater good of humanity. And so 
I look at my former experiences and being pigeonholed and having to teach different curriculums and recognizing it wasn't a space where I could thrive as an educator. And I saw my students not thriving as well. And so I came a little rebellious and I would just be like, I'm not doing that. And I've gotten in trouble for it. Right? I've had administrators tell me, no, you need to do this. And I have to say, you know what? One thing y'all are really good at is thinking about data. So let's do this. Let's let's let, let me do a pilot study. Let me teach this different unit, uh, same skills, same standards, same essential questions. But let me just pick a little bit of a different text. And let's look at uh, the, in six weeks, and six to eight weeks when we do the interim assessments, let's look at the data across the eighth grade because it was eighth grade at the time. And from there, let's make a decision, right? Then I can show you and prove to you that what I'm going to do actually works and is going to benefit all of the students. So one of my things that I had to learn was also speak to the data because sometimes administrators forget what it's like to be a teacher, and I don't understand why. Yes, I do. They're, they're far <laughs> removed. <laughs> I was like, they're, they're far removed. So one, speaking to the data and, the, and being super intentional about my rationale, why I'm teaching particular things. And I think because I have this freedom to teach, I'm able to process and think like that. And I mentioned earlier this idea of this co-learnership. So I'm super transparent. Like, look, I this is new for me. So I'm learning this just like just like you're learning it as well. So I'm going to mess up and that's okay, right? And when I mess up, I need y'all to let me know that I messed up. I need you to interrogate everything that I'm doing just as much as I'm interrogating what you're doing because it's the interrogation that allows us to think together and think critically and have dialogue about that. Now, the teachers that are in spaces that do not give them the ability to have this freedom to teach, what I really want to say, I probably cannot. So what I will offer to them is Lorena Herman has this book called the Anti-Racist Teacher Workbook. And it's in that workbook that she provides um, different strategies that, uh, that allow teachers that if you have to follow a particular curriculum that is dealing with banned books, there are ways to pull in these conversations around identity. There are ways to put in these conversations around equity and justice. And it's all in the, the how you frame your questions. And in reading her book, shout out to Lorena, and reading her book, um, I recognize framing questions um, for literature that may not be super representative of students was a way to bring our voices into the space and to bring our experiences into the space as well. Because I, I believe that all literature by voices of color is good for everybody. And I also believe that when I began to frame and work with teachers about how they frame questions, allow them to think about missing perspectives, allow them to think about how words are being used, how how authors are using diction, what is that saying? That allows to create space to bring in these topics or themes that are not controversial, just a reflection about everyday life into spaces that be may be a little bit more hesitant in working with diverse voices or even trying to work banned books, right? So let's say you have to read The Great Gatsby, my least favorite book in the world. And there's a way to teach that. There's a way to have these conversations and thinking about who who are the main characters here? Who are the protagonists? Why, what is it saying about the time period? There's a period in, in the book where the line is like, and I'm paraphrasing, they entered the room. Who is the they that they're talking about? Let's think about the context of this, right? This is this particular time period. What was happening amongst different groups in our world, our society, right? So when they talk about, when he says they, he's not giving them a name. Why is he not giving them a name? What does that say of how he values the people that are in this room doing this type of work? So I think that is a way to really help those that are, unfortunately in places that are working that are like ban these books although the banned books are the best books to read however that is some strategies that i think that teachers can walk away with using her book is super profound and super helpful and it belongs in every single teacher's library yeah <clears throat> i love that response i heard a lot of 
practical wisdom um, that teachers could definitely tap into. And definitely shout out to Lorena Herman, two-time AOTA guest here on the show. So we'll link those episodes below this too, because yeah, a lot of dope uh, dope tools and resources that, that she's de- certainly been a part of. And um, yeah, all right. So very much appreciate that. And, and your reputation precedes you when it comes to doing this work in the classroom and really uplifting and really um, standing firm in, at, again, at that intersection of, of justice and joy in the classroom. And yet here you are also stepping towards the academic space by deciding recently to pursue your PhD at NYU. So first of all, congrats on that. Um, big move there, New York University. And you're still you're still in the classroom too, doing this PhD work while also still doing the great work in the classroom. So uh, we have plenty of folks who watch our show or listen to our show who are dope educators who have considered maybe or are currently considering um, those academic spaces and whether or not it's right for them to go back to school because, you know, those ivory towers historically haven't been very welcoming to classroom teachers, uh, but especially to to educators of color um, specifically. So what, what all was involved? in you making the decision to pursue academia and what words of wisdom or what thoughts or considerations would you like to put out there for educators who who might also be considering making a similar move towards going to grad school, um, especially young dope educators of color out there who who might be considering it? So there's a story behind that. (laughs) So I was at an executive meeting uh, when I was a secondary representative at large for NTTE. And we were in a meeting and everyone kept saying like, oh, I'm working on my dissertation or I'm Dr. So-and-so. And I looked over to my big sister and mentor in the field, Dr. Latrice Johnson, who does amazing work around writing. And I was like, wow, everybody has their doctorate or they're working toward it. And she looked at me and she was like, it's time. And as a kid in Brooklyn, <laughs> you know, you speak, you do it, right? So it was right then and there. I just started looking and applications rolled around super quick and I compiled it all together and here we are. And I think as a kid, I really, uh, I remember meeting my first Black professor um, and also like the first Black person I knew that had a doctorate. I had to be about maybe about eight or nine and they referred to them as Dr. So-and-so. And I was like, oh, they must be an MD. And, and she, a Black woman, was like, no, I'm a professor of education. And I was like, you know, I want to be a teacher. And we had this nice conversation. And she was just like, you know, do you want to pursue your doctorate? And I was just like, I don't even know what that means, miss. But hmm. it might be something I want to consider. You go into the field and you learn that when you're an undergraduate or a master's student, we're looking at all these research and we're looking at all these texts. And I've always wondered who is doing this work, who's doing this research that teachers are utilizing in their classrooms, who's providing these frameworks that teachers can utilize to provide with their students. Come to find out, most of them were in the academy and academia. I might get slighted for this, but I also I still feel the academy is not super, it is still super whitewashed um, in the ways that it operates. However, I think about, I've never been a person to do what everyone else is doing. And I've never been a person to follow the trend. I've always been a trendsetter. (laughs) So I think that um, my reason for going into academia was one, to get on this side of research and scholarship and begin to be a voice, a Black voice that's going to talk about Black people, folks of color, Indigenous groups, Hispanic and Latin communities and ground that in research and how we can better support our students that are in these type of communities and from these different ethnic groups. But also there is a big gap, I believe, as a, as a current practitioner and an emerging scholar, there was a big gap between the practitioners and the academy. And it really bothers me because we're at the groundwork. Like we're doing the groundwork. We're on the ground. We're working with students day in and day out. We're applying the different strategies and frameworks and research that's coming out. And so I was like, where is the bridge? And maybe that's me, right? I can't say that I would graduate and immediately go into academia. I really can't say that because I do love the groundwork that I do in K-12 and the work that I do it in high school. I, like, I really love that work and working with young people. They keep me young. They keep me looking young, feeling young. <laughs> the things that they buy, I buy. So there are all the things that 
I don't know if I necessarily would go there immediately, but to be a bridge between and to show other young teachers coming in, like you can be a practicing K-12 teacher and still be a scholar. You can be a researcher and a teacher. You can do teacher action research. You can do theoretical research. You can do it all. You can apply it all. And you can literally create space for both the those in the academy that want to and those that are in case of that want to come together and really do some interesting and valuable work that is going to push our field forward. Because I do believe in the profession. And I think what was going to make me grow as a better teacher was to go this route and to get and to begin to be a student at this level. Because now my mind has shifted how I even teach my students the different terminologies that I'm using to describe things. I'm taking this discourse analysis class, my professor fire and mm. how I present work in my AP language and composition class is completely different. How I'm teaching them rhetoric, what that looks like is completely different. And it's all because I've been a student at this level. So not only will it make me an emerging scholar and a scholar and a researcher, it'll make me a better teacher and practitioner for my children on the field and doing the groundwork as well as working with teachers because I want them to see you too can do this. You, We need more scholars of color. We need young scholars of color. We need old scholars of colors. We need people that are consistently going to put their feet to the table and work with educators as they're working with our youth, because it is the truth. Whitney said it, our children are the future. And if we, if we move away from them so much and go to a space that they may get to, they may not, because it all depends on what they would like to do with their life. Am I really doing my life's work and purpose? So I feel like my purpose is to really work in both realms. And if I do that, then I feel like I'm living what I'm supposed to be doing. I hope that makes sense. Oh, it absolutely makes sense. And I, I you were really just giving us so much to think about there, Lamar. I think around the the bridge uh, between the research space and the practitioner space. And it has always been such a struggle in our field to to close that gap, right? And to to ensure that both, you know, the folks in the ivory tower have their feet on the ground, so to speak, in, in the real work of teaching and learning in, in the K-12 system, and also that educators in the K-12 system are given the access, the time, the space to be continual learners about their practice with research and scholarship in mind. And, and you know, it continues to be a struggle in many ways, but, uh, it's inspiring to hear about your journey on on that front and and working to be part of that bridge, um, literally yourself uh, in, in this case. And so, um, appreciate that that offering to our uh, our listeners and our viewers. Um, to- when I was in uh, undergrad, because I went to undergrad for English education, I knew I was going to be a teacher. Right, my professor created this like lab classroom space. And I think that was, that thing shifted so much for us. I often feel like some teachers go into the classroom, they're not like really prepared. I mean, we learn all these theories and we learn all of these different strategies, but sometimes the application, you're like, wait, what? What am I supposed to do? How do I make sense of this? That lab classroom shifted and changed the game for me because we were having real deal experiences teaching students, working with teachers at a high school in Buffalo, New York. Um, And I think that is, I've seen a person like Latrice Johnson write about this experience of being in academia, but still working with a high school, having a lab classroom, still teaching a class, right? So it's still current and fresh and new. And I think that that is something also that I would want to contribute. I want to make sure that this concept of a lab classroom is thriving and whenever I get to that space of being in academia fully, because then I, I, I'm i bridging, right? I'm not only am I bridging as a K-12 teacher and as a scholar, but then it's like, I'm even doing it when I get to the academic level where, because I understand the necessity and I understand how teachers learn. Like to learn to be a teacher is difficult, but it's so much hands-on. And when it's super hands-on, when that first year comes, you're not as scared. You're not as nervous. You're really to just throw your hands to the towel. You're going to drown anyway. It's year one. It's okay. But <laughs> but you are so much more prepared than maybe somebody else. All right. I'm done. Mm, yeah. No, appreciate that very much. Um, 
to maybe go a little bit further down the 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 road, uh, Lamar, of your doctoral studies, we mentioned in the you know in your bio that your studies are focusing on a combination of Afrofuturism and ethnic studies, which is a uh, fascinating um, combination of, of fields. Um, and we'd love to learn a b- little bit more about that. First, I, I can imagine that for some folks in our audience, the, the concept of Afrofuturism might be a new one. So if you could share with us what Afrofuturism is and, and how you connect that to uh, the field of ethnic studies, which is probably more familiar to, uh, to most, if not all, of our audience. Um, but if you could share that and then also just uh, a little bit about your vision for how uh, each of these fields might contribute to you know, the ongoing fight and work for educational justice that we've been talking about. So... Um... <laughs> This question is is so complex for me because Afrofuturism, one, right, to answer that question, is, I'm going to say it in layman's terms, and shout out to Dr. Stephanie Tolliver for writing an article about this and breaking down the definition in layman terms. So it Afrofuturism allows us to think about past and present of Black people and then think about how we can also thrive in the future. So it's not about surviving, it's about thriving. And so this idea of imagination, this idea of doing doing things and characters working and being in spaces that are not the norm is what Afrofuturism is. Afrofuturism is. And it allows you to go forward and it allows you to push. It allow, I mean, it pushes the envelope in ways that I've never seen literature do before as a reader of it. And it creates it creates a speculative world where anything is possible and anything is possible in the space for black people thriving. A lot of times, sometimes it's like, okay, so these characters are surviving. Cool. Great. But what does it look like to put a character in a world that they can really do the impossible? And that's the thing I love about Afrofuturism because it forces me to dream. It forces me to use my imagination. It forces me to play. And Octavia Butler has been such a, crucial writer of of whose work that I read often, I'm currently reading a book of hers right now, because she pushes my brain to think the impossible and to create characters without limitation. And she even said that in an interview, I wanted to work and write speculative fiction. I wanted to write Afrofuturistic work because I wanted to create characters without limitations and imagine teaching students what that looks like, living a life without limitations. What does that really look like? Dreaming about the possibilities of what your world could be. That is the work that really speaks to my heart and speaks to the students that I work with. Because as for the as long as I'm in a K-12 setting, I am only working with students of color. That is just me. I work with students that come from my community. There is a, a, a automatic love there and an understanding because we have very similar similar experiences. So that's one, how I would describe Afrofuturism. Now, my love for ethnic studies, and I know it's super big in the West. I was teaching eighth grade and one of my students said to me, I don't want to read this. I could care less. I want to read about my people. She was a Mexican-American girl and she was one of my favorite kids. We didn't, we're not supposed to have favorites, but let's be real. <laughs> so she's one of my favorite kids. And when she she said that, to, it pushed me. And I was like, well, how do I, I don't know anything about, you know, Mexican-American history or Mexican history or indigenous culture. I know things, but not a lot. So I was like, there has to be something out there that's going to push me to be able to give a framework to students. And lo and behold, ethnic studies, it was there. And Dr. Kim Parker gave me an opportunity a few years ago to write about it and how I use it in my classroom. And I think this idea of characters thriving without limitations and using counter narratives and teaching authentic stories is what I want to build together because then we can have other conversations about equity, justice, truth. We can begin to print, present stories about various groups of color because I even, you know, although Afrofuturism is indebted within Black culture, I think about what does a speculative world look like for our Indigenous brothers and sisters? What does it look like for our Hispanic and Latin brothers and sisters? What about an Asian culture? So I'm doing some research and trying to find other literature. I just finished reading this book called Mexican Gothic, and I was like, I have never read a book that was 
centered around uh, a Latin family, but that was in the speculative world. I was like, this is so dope. This is cool. And I was talking about it with my kids and we started talking about like position and power. And so I think these two, one genre, one discipline allows us to have these conversations easy. It can be so hard and harsh talking about race and power and privilege and justice and inequity and equity. It can be such a difficult conversation. And I think Afrofuturism, speculative fiction, and ethnic studies kind of grounds us to naturally have these conversations, to naturally put these different things on the table and see how it's been utilized and also how groups of color are flipping it on its head and, and saying, no, here's the truth. Let me tell you what really happened, right? And so I work with history teachers and I'm just like, you're, I have one teacher that I'm working with. She teaches American history. And I'm like, do you not know what you could do with this? Like, I understand you have an exam at the end of the year that you need to kind of prep students for. Fair. But do you not know what you can do with American history if you flipped it to an ethnic studies perspective? What? The engagement that students would have? Learning other stories? from other groups of color, noticing similarities and differences, thinking about power, talking about identity, talking about gender, groups of color, ethnic groups that are working and framing themselves but not being limited. Our indigenous brothers and sisters have been doing this type of work of not being limited from the beginning of time. And so that is what I want to offer and bring to scholarship. And that is what I want to offer and bring to teachers. And that is why I want to combine the discipline and the genre together. Because I think it will help teachers begin to have these uncomfortable conversations organically. Because it presents itself easily on the paper. Mm. I love that. I think it's important to note, I teach at Octavia Butler's alma mater. And we do teach U.S. history through ethnic studies lens, and our students have a year-long course in ethnic studies um, as their as their U.S. history requirement. And um, just just putting it out there, we ain't nowhere near Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying? But there's uh, some deep connections there, and your work sounds <laughs> fascinating. And uh, we're just very, very much appreciative of getting to preview um, your journey from afar and learn about your, uh, your work and, and your continued work towards helping us all fight for more humanizing classroom spaces that serve our students of color right. So shout out to you. Thank you again for being here on All of the Above. We, we hope to have you again down the line because uh, you, you referenced a previous guest who was on a couple times. So like, you know what I'm saying? Lorraine Herman came on twice. So I feel like down the line, as you approach that doctorate, we could do a little check-in on how those studies have gone and um, what uh, how you've continued to grow through that. So once again, thank you, Lamar Timmons-Long, for being here on All of the Above, folks. Check down below for links to some of the uh, some of the resources mentioned there. And, um, you know, up next is going to be our class dismissed. We're going to shout out some other folks doing great things in the world of education. Stay tuned. All right, folks, we have reached that point in the episode where we like to give shout outs to folks doing wonderful things in the world of education. And I, I just love the one that we have today. I love the youth, man. Jeff, what do we got? What do we got? Tell us who's getting flowers. <laughs> uh, well, today, man, well, maybe no one's getting flowers, but someone's getting flags uh, <laughs> in, today's, in today's story. Lots and lots of flags and absolutely more power uh, to this young person and all the people supporting this person. So we have been telling some truth out here about uh, some of the, the dangerous right-wing things happening here in California, Manuel, and even in relatively close proximity to us here in Los Angeles County. Um, you know, we have some school districts around our periphery who are doing the same kind of Florida, Texas, Mississippi stuff that, uh, that we see happening across the country. Um, so we have this, just this, it's, it's both a troubling story and also a beautiful story of resistance and, and you know, asserting one's First Amendment rights and speaking truth in the face of power. Um, so this comes to us from the Temecula Valley Unified School District. Um, and 
It's uh, an article that appeared in uh, on KTLA.com. That's the Channel 5 station out here in Southern California. Um, and it's called Southern California Student Protest School Flag Ban by Handing Out Hundreds of Pride Flags. And uh, so this student, Moxie, who's a 16-year-old junior at Great Oak High School in Temecula, uh, decided to protest the district's controversial flag ban policy by handing out a whole bunch of pride flags and pins. And uh, the student is now facing some sanction or disciplinary consequences, and a whole bunch of other people in the community have rallied around Moxie and also been <laughs> been handing out pride flags. Um, of course, in the district, the you know the sort of veneer of righteousness is around this policy, saying that only um, you know federal or state flags can be flown on school campuses across the district. Um, but obviously, it's a good thing for there to be pride flags present, affirming spaces um, being advertised uh, on a school campus where we welcome and affirm all young people who come into our spaces. So big props to Moxie for taking this courageous step and inspiring other people to join in. And I would say, I don't know if I know anyone, Manuel, in the uh, Temecula school system out there, but I'm like, go get like six, seven pride flags and just start putting them around, man. <laughs> Yeah. Like this is uh, strength in numbers here, and um, it is absolutely right to uh, support and affirm young people and provide safe spaces for young people on school campuses. So props to Moxie, props to Moxie's supporters across the district. Yeah, absolutely. I just loved it. Like seeing, I, I saw this on this report on TV and seeing the, the video of it. And then there's photos in the article, which we'll link below, but just like of all these little pride flags all over the place. It's just, uh, I just love it. Cause you know, here you have a, a pretty bigoted, hateful school board, or at least members on that school board who are bigoted and hateful and trying to ban and prohibit something and, and make sure no one can see it. So the, the Moxie's response is like, all right, I'll hand these joints out to everybody then. Cause come on now, like, I just, I, I love that. I love that approach. It's very sad and unfortunate that we have uh, and districts anywhere, but you know, especially here in super blue California, trying to ban a pride flag. Um, that's just ridiculous incredibly, incredibly um, wild stuff happening down there in Temecula and certain other districts as well. So shout out to Moxie and all the young people out there um, fighting the good fight and standing up and uh, showing the adults that um, <laughs> the adults got to catch up, man. The adults, man, they got to get their stuff together because come on now. So yeah, anyways, um, shout out to everybody still listening and still watching us here on All of the Above. Shout out to you for hanging in this whole time. Do remember, we have all of our previous episodes as well as links to how to support us, links to other platforms. So if you watch this on YouTube and you're like, yo, I got to subscribe so I can listen to this on the go, like just go to our website, all the different platforms, all the links, everything's there. Um, and of course, like all of our previous episodes going way back for years. So that website is AO tashow.com. We very much appreciate you joining us here today. If you liked anything that you heard or saw, please consider giving us that five star or that thumbs up. That goes a long way. We appreciate y'all. All right. We will see you next time.